welcome back. In, this, in this, the last segment of this section, we're going, to, we're going to see an example of hierarchical clustering applied to a study of breast cancer. So this is the last part of the segment. This is an example which actually Trevor and I are both involved in, um, actually 10 years ago now, with a postdoc at Stanford in oncology, Therese Sorley. Um, Therese had measured uh, gene expression um, from gene chips for about 88 women who had breast cancer, who were being treated for breast cancer, and gene expression measurements for about uh, uh, 8,000 genes. So what that means is for, for, for each of the 88 patients, there's a quantitative measurement for each of 8,000 genes, um, which measures how, how much that gene was expressing, how active it was for that woman. And this is a very common kind of study now where people look at gene expression to try to understand the basis of diseases like breast cancer and figure out whether there are subtypes of, of, of the disease which should be treated uh, in a different way. So this is quite large, the amount of data. 88 patients, 8,000 um, features. She used, or we, the group used, um, average linkage with correlation metric. Again, because this is a case where um, genes are in the same units in a sense, but they're measured in the same units, but um, the actual level of gene expression wasn't very reliable because it varies across the way it's measured. But what was more thought to be more important was the shape of the, 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 the relative expression of different genes for the same patient. So that's why we use correlation metric. Um, and we did hierarchical clustering of the samples of the 88 patients. Now, when Therese first used the full set of genes, the clustering she got out wasn't, uh, wasn't satisfactory. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's just, again, it's, a, it's very subjective, but uh, it, it didn't... It wasn't very informative to her, to, to Therese and her collaborators. So rather, they use a, a subset of the genes called the intrinsic gene. So this is a, a, a way of choosing a, a most more informative subset of genes. And I won't go into the detail except to say in the words, in this particular study, these women were given chemotherapy. And there was actually a, a sample taken before and after for each woman. And gene expression measurements were available before and after. So what Therese uh, did was she, she defined what called intrinsic genes. So for each woman, for each gene, for each woman, we looked to see which genes had the smallest variation within a woman, within a woman, as opposed to between the 88 women. And the ones with the smallest variation were, were defined to be the, the intrinsic genes, the 500 most, this is the 500 genes with, with lowest variation. The idea being, again, this is a, a biological concept, was that genes which didn't vary much in a woman, before and after chemotherapy, compared to the, the uh, between women variation, were thought to be intrinsic to her cell biology. So they were thought to be the, the ones that could, could best drive the clustering and, sh and, and separate the women in terms of their biology and maybe their response to so treatment. They, they varied a lot between women, but yeah. little within women uh, right. uh, across the two repeated measures. So doing that, we, uh, we got the following clustering. So what do we see here? First of all, this is the, um, here are the, 500 or so intrinsic genes, and this is called a heat map. And this is a common display for this kind of data. So what do we see here? Each row of the heat map is a gene, 500 or so genes. Each column is a woman, one of the 88 women. And each pixel is, uh, is displayed as either uh, green, which is negative. So the, the gene expression, it's normalized, so it runs from something like minus 5 to plus 5. So green would be negative, and red is positive. So green means the gene expression for that gene for that woman is lower than average, and red means it's higher than average. And uh, what's been done here is we, we applied hierarchical clustering to the columns, that's the women, in the way I just described. Uh, in addition, hierarchical clustering was done to the rows, the genes. And this is done in both directions. And that's why this picture looks, it's got, it's, uh, ha has patches of red and green, right? Because it looks, it, because we've sorted them, basically, we've sorted the we done hierarchical clustering, and we sorted the observations by the order of the leaves in the tree, both for genes and both for, and for samples. And that's why if, if we just displayed the data in the order we, we obtained it, this picture would not look so nice. So it would be uh, a checkerboard pattern. It would look, it would look very random. But see, here, here it looks much more structured because of the clustering has been applied and the ordering of the leaves has, has, has been used to reorder the rows and columns. Um, just a this actually, this kind of display was actually start, used first at Stanford in the, in the, in the uh, genomics labs in, around the time the 
the uh, gene chip was invented, which is also done partly here at Stanford. And I think this has become very attractive just because it's just a, it's a nice way just to see all the data, right? If you have, if you're given uh, a, a data set of, of 88 observations, women, and, and 8,000 genes, that's a lot of data just to even look at. And so the first kind of challenge is how do I just make a display so I can look at all the data and see the, the gross patterns? And here, this is actually a very effective display. This is he, one of the yeah. pioneering um, efforts yeah. in, the, in the labs of right. uh, Patrick Brown and, and David Botstein, where uh, gene expression right. really started. So, you know, it, it's kind of sort of funny to think that a, a, you know, a, a, a pioneering uh, piece of science is actually a display, but that's often the case, right? Some, some, things, some very simple things which might be, seem trivial actually can have a lot of impact. Just in this case, just the ability to, to look at, to arrange and, and display the data informatively was very useful, and it's still used a lot today. So here's the full heat map, and, that, and then the, the clustering tree is at the top. This is here, and it's been expanded out here, and um, it's, it's been divided into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight clusters. Um, the gray is just basically an unknown group, but the, the other clusters have been labeled by names, like uh, normal, basal, ERB2, luminal A, luminal B. These names were, were chosen by Therese and collaborators based on the genes that were expressing in the, in the groups. So if, now if we look at this picture, what we've taken is the same clusters, and we've just taken subsets of the rows, that's these five groups, and these are genes which are expressing highly in one or more of these key groups. Like for example here, let's see. Um, this block of C genes is expressing highly in the red group and the blue group. This block of D genes is expressing highly in these clusters, etc. So then uh, the oncologist will, will, will look at this and they'll try to understand, well, how are the... So these groups are different with respect to these particular genes. What do these genes do in the cells and um, what does it tell us about the, the, these, these subgroups? In particular, let's on to the, the last display of this, if you look at these subgroups, and you look at their survival of these women, these are called Kappa-Meyer survival curves, right? Um, these, is, these women were, were treated with cancer, for, for cancer and followed up to see how, and hopefully, you know, uh, recovered. Some didn't, and the survival curves of the groups are given here. So, for example, uh, the basal group, I believe, the red, and the purple, which groups are those? Basils, uh, basal and Erby 2 are doing not nearly as well. They're, they're probably survival is much worse, whereas the, um, this group, the black group, the luminal A is doing much better. So because their survival is quite different, the scientists were really wanted to find out how are these groups different and with respect to what genes, and that gives us a clue as to how the, how the diseases might be different in the different groups. So that's an example of clustering for, in a real scientific problem that's of importance. So, just to wrap up this section now, um, unsupervised learning is what has been the topic. We've talked about principal components and clustering, uh, and that's, they're, they're important in general for, for, for understanding the variation and, and grouping structure of a set of, of unlabeled data. So, they can be useful uh, for themselves, um, just by themselves, as we saw, for example, in the, that last example, or as a, a preprocessor to choose a linear combination of features for supervised learning. Um, and we also saw that the problem is intrinsically harder than supervised learning because there's no, there's no label, there's no gold standard. So we can't use, you can't use prediction error to figure out how well we're doing. Well, we've just shown you two techniques right. in, in these presentations, principal components right. and clustering. And those are part of a, a big tool by our bag of lots of other techniques. Some of them are listed here like self-organizing maps, independent component analysis, spectral clustering, and many more. Many more of these are covered in our book, Elements of Statistical Learning, in Chapter 14, and even beyond that, there are many others as well.